I'm Pete Daly, CEO of the U.S. Naval Institute. Welcome to our conference, the New China Challenge. This conference was made possible with the generous support of the William M. Wood Foundation in Boston, and we're honored to have Ed Condit and his wife Nancy here today representing them. Each year, the Naval Institute partners with the Naval Academy to host an applied history conference exploring an important issue, its place in history, the current situation, and the implications for the future. We'll review the rise of China as a global power, the future of the U.S.-China relationship, the key security challenges involved. We'll debate the potential for conflict and imagine what a future conflict might look like and whether it can be avoided. We're going to discuss the complex competitive challenges that pertain to China in the strategy realm, the political realm, and the economic realm. I'm struck as we considered this topic that there's an old Chinese expression, we live in interesting times. And you never quite know if that's a good thing or not. But there's another expression from the Bible that says, you reap what you sow. And I think I know what that means. So all those aspects are available here today as part of our discussion. And we've had the pleasure of working with Professor Yang Dang, Professor of the Department of Political Science here at the U.S. Naval Academy to build this conference. And additionally, we've had the pleasure of working with the Allies Club with midshipmen that work civil military affairs and particularly want to recognize the efforts of midshipman Taylor Sparks. Extend a most important welcome to the midshipmen who are here with us today. And it's now my pleasure to introduce the superintendent of the Naval Academy. Vice Admiral Ted Carter graduated from the Academy in 1981. He was designated a Naval Flight Officer in 1982 and graduated from the Navy Fighter Weapons School, Top Gun, in 1985. He spent extensive time at sea deploying around the globe. He's experienced combat. He's flown 125 combat missions in Bosnia, Kosovo, Kuwait, Iran, and Afghanistan. He served as the commanding officer of the fast combat store ship USS Camden, the aircraft carrier Carl Vinson, and as flag officer, he commanded the Enterprise Carrier Strike Group during the Big E's final deployment in 2012. Admiral Carter previously served as the 54th president of the U.S. Naval War College. Ladies and gentlemen, the 62nd superintendent of the United States Naval Academy, Vice Admiral Ted Carter. Well, good morning to each and every one of you. I want to say a special welcome whether this is the first time you've ever been to the United States Naval Academy or your 25th, uh, today is truly a special day. It's not just this great day of uh, having a, uh, what I would consider to be a historic conversation about uh, the threat of China. It's also our 173rd birthday here at the United States Naval Academy. Today is our Founders Day, 10 October, 1845. So how about a big round of applause for the Naval Academy, <laughs> Founders Day. Uh, this is the fifth opportunity I've had a chance to uh, open remarks here uh, for the U.S. Naval Institute, and I'm very, very proud of our partnership that we have here at the Naval Academy and the Naval Institute. Uh, this is an important discussion that we're having here today, and it's relevant uh, that we're doing it here at the Naval Academy. Uh, for myself personally, uh, I've been in the Navy for 37 years. Uh, as Pete uh, spent way too much time on bi my biography, uh, the only thing you need to know is uh, I've been at sea a lot. And a lot of it has been in the Pacific theater, especially in the early part of my, my career on carriers like Midway and Independence. Uh, so I thought I would make just a couple of remarks here that maybe will be a little bit of a scene setter before I introduce our first keynote speaker. Last week, a Chinese destroyer maneuvered within yards of the USS Decatur's bow as she sailed in the vicinity of the Gavin Reefs in the South China Sea. There, may, there are two main points that we should gather from this event. First, despite being in international waters and near reefs disputed by no less than four independent nations, China announced that its destroyer was appropriately defending China's indisputable sovereignty 
Second, the Chinese ship maneuvered to force the almost near collision, knowing that Decatur would be forced to avoid any navigational mishap in light of PR fallout that may come from last summer's collisions uh, of the McCain and the Fitzgerald, which might even put American warships at a slight tactical disadvantage. The lesson to be learned is that competition between the United States and China in the South China Sea must be addressed strategically, as well as tactically with military, political, and especially economic threads running throughout every facet. For centuries, the South China Sea has been a focal point in world geopolitics. Nearly 200 years ago, China suffered a crushing defeat to Western powers in the Opium Wars, which disintegrated its government, social structure, and their very way of life. That defeat ushered in a century of humiliation, which is indoctrinated into every Chinese student to this very day. China has a long memory, takes a long view, and plays the long game. Make no mistake, as the United States and her allies plan for military relevance in the next day and even in the next years, in fact, just this morning, our Secretary of Defense, Secretary Mattis, declared that 80% of all tactical jet aircraft in our Navy and our Air Force will be full mission capable by the end of 2019. Meanwhile, China is planning for operations over the next century. To successfully navigate China's rising challenge to the global economic and political system, American and world leaders must first recognize that competition exists and then counter Chinese manipulations and bolster democratic institutions. Tactically, this means the United States need to think economically about what weapon systems and, man and manpower can bring to bear in the Western Pacific. The Air Force recently announced that it needs 25 percent more squadrons to counter Russia and China aggression. Similarly, our Navy is planning to build its fleet to 355 ships. Specifically, advanced nuclear submarines are the key naval countermeasure to a, po a modern Chinese Navy. The United States needs to plan ahead to make sure it has the military, political, and economic ability to produce, equip, and train these high-end submarines in the next 20 years. While advanced nuclear submarines are a tactical advantage in the American military in East Asia, that does not mean our carrier battle groups and our surface fleet are obsolete, quite the opposite. Carrier battle groups do one critical thing better than any other asset in the world. They show our U.S. Navy's muscle and resolve. Now, because we are the Naval Academy and we're steeped in tradition, we often think about our history. Uh, and with this, I would highlight that over a century ago, when President Roosevelt ordered a 16 white-hulled battleships and their attending auxiliary ships to circumnavigate the world. Now, of course, those battleships were the aircraft carriers of today. But it's more than just the hardware that we're talking about. It's more than just an event where we showed off our Navy for the first time in a trip around the world. It's about the people that were involved. Three great Navy leaders start, started their storied careers embarked with that great white fleet. The first was Bull Halsey, a 1904 graduate from this institution and newly commissioned ensign on the battleship Kansas. He would go on to become one of our Navy's four fleet admirals. In this role, he would command Third Fleet in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, considered by many to be the largest naval, naval battle in history. Admiral Ray Spruance, a 1907 graduate, trained on the Minnesota as a midshipman during her historic around-the-world cruise. He would later go on to command U.S. Naval Forces during the two most significant Allied victories in the Pacific Theater, the Battle of Midway and the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And finally, Theodore Spuds Ellison, classmate of Chester Nimitz, 1905, saw the Great Fleet come in while serving aboard submarines in Southeast Asia. It was during this time overseas that his friend and fellow submariner, Ken Whiting, would convince him to apply to a fledgling program called Aviation School. He would soon become the first designated U.S. Naval Aviator. It comes as no coincidence as these three men served together in a critical period of American history. Alongside with 14,000 other sailors, they would gain invaluable experience abroad while announcing to the world the arrival of America as a significant naval power, uh, a power that we still enjoy today. And it comes as no coincidence that we host this conference here today at the Naval Academy on our 173rd birthday. I have no doubt that the next Halsey, Spruance, and Ellison 
are sitting here in this audience. The academic lessons that our midshipmen take part in at this school by the Severn, along with the training they experience at home and around the world, will prepare them to fight and win the Navy's next great battles. With that, it is my privilege and a pleasure to introduce to you our, our keynote speaker. He's the president of the Asia Society Policy Institute, a distinguished fellow at Chatham House, a distinguished statement, a statesman at CSIS, and former chair of the Independent Commission on Multilateralism. He is a former foreign minister and the 26th prime minister of Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the Honorable Kevin Rudd. Thank you. Well, uh, happy birthday, uh, U.S. Naval Academy here at Annapolis. You've been around for a while, uh, even older than the Admiral and myself, so, um, and uh, Graham Allison, who will be speaking to you soon. So it's good to celebrate important anniversaries. Six months ago, I was privileged to uh, address a similar gathering at, uh, at West Point. Six months later, it's great to be here with the U.S. Naval Academy and the U.S. Naval Institute here at Annapolis. Um, the subject is similar, understanding the rise of China, how China sees its future in the region and beyond, and what that means to the United States, its friends and allies around the world. I must confess, though, when I was at uh, West Point, I became a little bit confused as to uh, who the future adversary was. As everywhere I went at West Point, I just encountered signs which said, Beat Navy. <laughs> and I stayed in Beat Navy House. And uh, I think the Chinese could relax. I mean, if you guys are going to be at each other's throats like that. Uh, but I understand there is an annual grudge match. It comes up in December, is that right? And there are a few scores to settle. So uh, I uh, wish all of you here at uh, the US Naval Academy Godspeed and safe sailing in that encounter with Army. Uh, I know they'll be taking no prisoners from my time up there. The, uh, it's been my privilege in the past to uh, also address a gathering like this at the US Naval War College at uh, Rhode Island, and, uh, and a privilege to be here today. As uh, we've been reminded uh, today, it was from Hampton Heads at the mouth of this great Chesapeake Bay that Teddy Roosevelt's great white fleet departed on its uh, global tour in 1908. Uh, Teddy uh, had read his Maham. The Chinese have read Maham too. Uh, the fleet uh, visited Sydney and Melbourne and Albany and Western Australia. In fact, when I was Prime Minister of Australia, uh, next to my desk I had a black and white photograph from the Sydney Morning Herald of 1908, which uh, had the USS Connecticut uh, moored just outside the Prime Minister of Residence, a great capital ship of its age. You know, these things have an effect, and the roll-on effect of the visit of the Great White Fleet to Australia back, uh, back then was it triggered an enormous national debate about the formation of the Royal Australian Navy. And uh, as a result, come 1913, the first ships of the Royal Australian Navy arrived uh, through Sydney Heads. Battle cruisers, cruisers, destroyers. Inspired uh, by Teddy Roosevelt's, some thought, crazy idea back then to send the Great White Fleet around the country. But in terms of demonstrating to the world at large the arrival of American naval power and America's power as a great nation in the 20th century, uh, it was a singular event. Uh, we then, by the way, in Australia, then had a large fight with the British. Uh, you had a more physical fight with them not long before, a uh, hundred years or so before. Uh, when the Royal Australian Navy arrived, we declared, through one of my prime ministerial predecessors, this shall be an independent Royal Australian Navy. Uh, they declared that it will be a unit of the British Far Eastern Squadron. Uh, we told them to jump in the lake. Uh, and as a result, was born in 1913, the Royal Australian Navy. So all these years later, Thank you, Navy, uh, and thank you to President Teddy. Our naval forces since then have fought so many engagements together. Uh, we had ships uh, engaged with your Navy in the Pacific War, the big battles, Coral Sea, uh, Leyte Gulf, and others. And many of our sailors, 
uh, lost their lives and many of our ships went to the bottom, uh, as did yours. But these are the ties that bind. Our navies since then have also fought in combined naval operations uh, off Korea, off Vietnam, uh, and of course in the Gulf. As Prime Minister through the Australian Defence White Paper of 2009, I was proud to commission the largest peacetime expansion of the Royal Australian Navy in history, confirming the acquisition of two uh, helicopter carriers, enhancing their capability to take fixed-winged aircraft in the future should that become necessary, the increase of our surface fleet by a third and the doubling of our submarine fleet. These ships and boats have now either been completed or the construction is now in process. That naval expansion, and as you know, it takes time, had a strategic purpose in mind, namely the change in the economic and military balance of power between China and the United States. Ten years ago, the Australian Defence White Paper, after multiple meetings of the National Security Committee of the Australian Cabinet, which I chaired, concluded that China was not being transparent about its military buildup. China needed to become more transparent about what its strategic purposes were, that China intended to become a dominant economic power in the future and progressively a military power, and in the absence of clarity would induce reactions from its neighbours around the wider East Asian region. That was 10 years ago. And it was several years before there was any evidence of Chinese reclamation in the South China Sea. Indeed, I remember back then, with some sense of irony, dispatching my officials from Canberra to Tokyo to brief them just prior to the release of the Defence White Paper, where our Japanese colleagues were horrified that we Australians could be that blunt. They'd obviously not had a lot of dealings with Australians over the years. Uh, we tend to be that way. Not to be compared, however, with the reaction in Beijing when we dispatched our officials there to brief them, a matter of courtesy, before the release of the Defence White Paper. China's reaction was more acute. They too were horrified and demanded that we excise the clauses relevant to their own military rise. Uh, we declined, and the White Paper was published. For your allies, therefore, dealing with the complexities of the changing East Asian security environment over the years has had its own challenges, sometimes quite invisible to the Washington policy establishment. In the midst of all this, we in Australia have sought to prosecute a balanced relationship with Beijing, deeply mindful of our differences in values and interests and underlying values, while prosecuting an economic relationship to our mutual advantage. At various times, my government incurred Beijing's wrath on human rights, whether it was Tibet or Xinjiang or Australian Chinese citizens, on trade when we refused to allow Huawei access to the Australian telecom and broadband network based on our intelligence collaboration with the United States, or on rejecting certain strategic foreign investment proposals from Chinese SOEs like Chinalco, who sought to take over the second largest mining company in the world, Rio Tinto, an Australian corporate giant. Meanwhile, we expanded our security dialogue with Beijing, our trade volumes with China doubled, we approved the vast bulk of Chinese foreign investment proposals in non-sensitive areas of the economy, we ended up with more Chinese students in Australian universities than in any other country in the world, this is absolute numbers, other than the United States, and we worked intimately with Beijing through the G20 during the global financial crisis to help stabilise financial markets and return growth to the global economy. Dealing with China is complex and therefore requires acute analysis, policy resolve and clear-sighted vision. One month from tomorrow, we'll commemorate the 100th anniversary of the war to end all wars in November 1918, between the great powers of the 20th century. Except it didn't end wars. The rest, of course, is history, and the geopolitical map of the world has been redrawn three times since then. I believe that when we look back at 2018, history will mark this year as a profound turning point in the relations between the two great powers of the 21st century, the United States and China although none of us can confidently predict what the long-term geopolitical trajectory will be. To be clear, China's rise uh, as a global power did not begin in 2018. That began some 40 years ago and has continued under multiple Chinese administrations, albeit under a continuing single-party rule and a continuing strategic culture focused throughout on China's acquisition of national wealth and power. But while Chinese aggregate national power, what the Chinese refer to as comprehensive national power, 
has increased steadily under Deng, under Jiang, and under Hu. What has changed under Xi Jinping has been the clarity of the articulation of China's strategic intentions, reflected also in the increased operational tempo of Chinese policy actions around the world, militarily, diplomatically, and in its global economic reach. If the three pillars of strategic analysis are capabilities, intentions, and actions, it's clear from all three that China is no longer a status quo power. It's important, however, to be clear about where this increased national wealth and power fits within the wider worldview of Xi Jinping and his own particular set of national priorities. Here, my views have altered little since my remarks at West Point in March this year, in which I argued that Xi Jinping can best be understood as having a set of seven concentric circles of national interest. One, the centrality of the party, keeping the party in power for the long term, as well as Xi's power within the party well under control. Two, consolidating the internal unity of the country. Three, maintaining sustainable economic growth to ensure a continued increase in Chinese living standards, breaking through the middle income trap and balancing now against a parallel requirement for environmental protection now demanded by China's rising urban elites. Four, keeping China's 14 bordering countries in a benign and preferably supine state. Five, on China's maritime per periphery, projecting its regional naval and air power, politically fracturing US alliances in Asia, and ultimately removing the United States from the immediate region militarily. Six, levering its economic power across China's vast continental periphery, causing Eurasia and in time the Middle East and Africa to become accommodating to China's economic, foreign policy and national security interests. And seven, reforming parts, but not by no means all, of the post-war international rules-based order over time to better suit its interests, to better reflect China's domestic values, rather than those we see reflected in the post-war consensus of 1944-45. So how's Xi Jinping doing against those seven priorities? On internal politics, while Xi Jinping has consolidated power by purging those who opposed his appointment, the ruthless use of the anti-corruption campaign to that end, as well as cleaning up the party itself, and multiple changes to the command structures of the military, security, and intelligence apparatus, there is nonetheless grumbling in the party ranks about the cult of personality, the abolition of presidential term limits, and China's strategic overreach in relation to the United States. Still, it's impossible to readily identify any replacement leader or even successor leader at this stage. It's prudent, therefore, in my judgment, for policy planners to assume that Xi Jinping will be with us for at least another decade, health permitting. On national unity, the crackdown in Xinjiang and China's Northwest is beginning to generate a new human rights agenda focused against Beijing, this time not just from the West, but from parts of the Muslim world as well. Taiwan represents an even greater problem. Given the resilience of its democracy and its growing sense of local national identity separate from the mainland, reinforced by total generational change on Taiwan for whom pre-49 realities mean very little. Tibet also remains problematic. As for the economy, real growth has been slowing since early this year as a product of a slowdown uh, in further market-based economic reforms, a from-the-top deleveraging campaign to reduce the indebtedness of second-tier banks and financial institutions and SOEs, combined with the impact of, on business confidence of the trade war with the United States. This has resulted in a rapid fiscal and monetary policy easing by the Chinese authorities, with the effect of, of slowing actions for China to deal with its massive G, uh, debt overhang, currently at 266% of GDP. And that's before you factor in the Chinese public's demand for the party to act rapidly and radically on air pollution and climate change. In short, the economy could well turn into a liability rather than a strength, as it has been in enhancing party legitimacy for the last 40 years. China's neighboring state relationships from Beijing's perspectives are nonetheless in a reasonable state of repair. The relationship with Russia is being strengthened given their growing community of strategic interests against the United States. 
Beijing, given its newfound difficulties with America, is also taking the temperature down deliberately in its normally problematic relationships with both Tokyo and Delhi, where both Japan and India have been happy to oblige for the foreseeable future for their own domestic needs, but also because Japan and India are uncertain where the United States is headed in the long term. Vietnam is now, from Beijing's perspective, less problematic than it was given leadership changes in Hanoi, and because there is now less solidarity from the rest of ASEAN than ever before on the South China Sea. In the Philippines, despite President Duterte's unpredictable behavior, he's seen by Beijing as a surprising net gain. While Burma, seen several years ago as a net loss for Chinese interests with the election of Aung San Suu Kyi, has now improved remarkably for China with the resuscitation of ties between the PLA and the Burmese military. Furthermore, the rapprochement now between the US and North Korea and the much deeper one between North and South Korea has removed long-standing impediments to the structural improvement of China-North Korea relations, which had been in the icebox since 2011. What about China's maritime periphery? China now faces more assertive American behavior in challenging China's maritime territorial claims in the South China Sea. But across wider Southeast Asia, China sees a region gradually drifting in its direction. Whereas not long ago, Cambodia was seen as China's only reliable partner in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that is no longer the case. ASEAN is in strategic hedging mode, in part because of the enormity of the Chinese economic footprint over the region relative to the US, Europe, or even intra-ASEAN trade, reinforced by the investment dynamics of China's maritime Silk Road. The election of Mahathir in Malaysia, however, represents a fresh problem, where major Chinese infrastructure construction projects uh, and their contracts with the Malaysian government have been suspended. But based on China's experience elsewhere, this is likely to be seen as a tactical rather than a strategic setback. The central strategic factor working in China's favor in what I describe as the new great game, and that is Southeast Asia, not Central Asia, the new great game, is the absence of an American or European alternative to Chinese markets, foreign direct investment, and over time capital flows. China's objectives in this respect were enhanced when the United States decided to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This decoupled the United States from much of the future trade growth of Asia, thereby delivering a further win, in my judgment, to Beijing. So what about China's continental periphery? It's not been plain sailing. Nonetheless, for every country where there has been some pushback against China's Belt and Road Initiative, there is another queuing up to be part of it where resistance is encountered either on debt, on labor standards, environmental standards, or the loss of local sovereignty, many in Washington seem to think that this is the end of the matter. Well, it ain't. What we find is that China usually changes tactics to deal with the particular problem on the ground that it's encountered, and then works it through to a new pragmatic outcome, as we've seen in countries as diverse as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Zambia. With now more than 70 countries signed up to the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, again, the strategic factor working for China is the absence of an American alternative to the BRI. China's biggest impediment in fully delivering on its BRI vision is less likely to be foreign resistance to it, but rather the long-term drain on the financial resources on the Chinese treasury from investments in too many financially non-performing projects across the wider region. Finally, on the future of the global rules-based order and the critical international institutions that give effect to it, China would be reasonably content with its progress. The US withdrawal from the United Nations Human Rights Commission is seen in Beijing as a godsend because that has been for the Chinese the single most problematic institution in providing its regular country reports on China's human rights performance domestically which attacks, therefore, the domestic legitimacy of the Chinese regime. Similarly, the US attack on the WTO has enhanced China's standing in that institution, despite China's general reluctance to embrace fundamental global trade liberalization, one would open all of its markets. The US attacks on the UN itself has similarly enabled China to look like a responsible global stakeholder within the UN multilateral system, 
enhanced by China's increasing aid budgets, greater contribution to UN peacekeeping, and greater number of appointments of Chinese per personnel across UN agencies. China's main problem in the United Nations Security Council is its close voting relationship with Russia on resolutions that are sensitive to non-Western states, for example, on Syria. Nonetheless, China's global economic diplomacy across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the tiny island states of the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, and the Caribbean is formidable. And enhanced by its growing diplomatic network, this means that China is able to marshal formidable political support for its position in multiple United Nations fora around the world. Whether this sort of support for China's tactical interests uh, on the issues of the day will ultimately translate into a more fundamental structural support for a formal rewrite of the rules and practices of the current international system is a much more open question. China's historical diplomacy has usually been much more gradualist than that, to bring about de facto changes over time, rather than necessarily proclaim a de jure reform. Time will tell as China's national self-confidence rises and its global influence grows. Therefore, looking at Xi Jinping's seven sets of priorities, from China's perspective, the country, the region, and the world represents a complex picture. What is clear, however, is that China under Xi Jinping has a worldview. It also has a grand strategy to give effect to that worldview. And it would be prudent for the rest of us to assume that absent major and sustainable policy changes, either in Beijing or Washington, that China has a view that at least has a reasonable chance of success. If China's operational strategy towards the United States has been largely constant over the last 40 years, albeit with a newly defined declaratory clarity, as well as operational intensity under Xi Jinping, what now seems to have changed fundamentally is in fact the US response to this Chinese strategy. We see this clearly articulated in the December 2017 National Security Strategy of the United States. We see it stated plainly in the US National Defense Strategy of January 2018. We see it in the launching of the trade war in June of 2018 and its intensification across this summer. We see it in the release of the Department of Defense's report in September 2018 on the future needs of US defense manufacturing industry and technology. And we have seen it in October 2018 with Vice President Pence's address to the Hudson Institute. We live in interesting times. If we were to distill the essence of these various statements of US declaratory intent, for me, it seems to boil down to the following. First, that the period of strategic engagement, quote unquote, between China and the United States for the post-78 period failed to produce sufficient domestic market opening in the Chinese economy for American firms for export and investment, that China, rather than becoming a responsible stakeholder, quote unquote, in the global rules-based order, is instead now constructing an alternative order with Chinese characteristics, and that China, rather than becoming more democratic in its domestic politics, has decided now to double down as a Leninist state. Two, in addition to the above, that China now intends to push the United States out of East Asia and the Western Pacific and in time surpass the US as the dominant global economic power. Three, that China seeks to achieve its national and international dominance over the United States through the hollowing out of US domestic manufacturing and technology, through China's state-directed industry, export and foreign investment strategies, also through a range of economic incentives and financial inducements to American partners, friends and allies around the world, as well as the rapid expansion of China's military and naval presence from the East China Sea, the South China Sea, across the littoral states of the Indian Ocean, and Djibouti now in the Red Sea. Fourth, that these factors combined together with Russia represent the, quote unquote, central strategic challenge to American security and prosperity for the future, and therefore warrant an urgent, an urgent change in American strategic course from strategic engagement with China to a period formally characterized now as strategic competition. And fifth, that this new American national strategy will become multidimensional, aimed at rolling back Chinese diplomatic, military, economic, aid, and ideological advances abroad.
If this new direction in U.S. declaratory strategy towards China is reflected in future U.S. operational policy, 2018 will indeed represent a fundamental disjuncture in the U.S.-China relationship. In this address, I have not been asked to reflect on the wisdom or otherwise of the new direction of U.S. strategy towards China, and I don't intend to. Ultimately, it's a matter for the United States. I'm just an Australian citizen, currently a political refugee here in the United States, living, working happily in New York in charge of an American think tank. Although all your allies in Asia will be profoundly affected by the decisions you and your Chinese counterparts take in the months and years ahead on these questions. So what I intend to do here is simply run through a number of factors that I'm sure the administration will be considering, and I know your friends and allies will be reflecting on, as the US contemplates the operationalization of its new strategy of strategic competition with China. Number one, what does Washington do if China does not acquiesce to American demands as outlined in Vice President Pence's speech, but instead explicitly rejects them? If strategy, a term derived from the Greek term for generalship, is defined as a plan of action designed to achieve a long-term desired objective, then what happens if it not only fails to produce the desired objective, but instead produces the reverse, namely an increasingly mercantilist, nationalist, and combative China? This goes to the core question of what is the desired end state of this new period of strategic competition, and whether new American policy measures will bring about that objective. They may, they may not. There are, of course, two broad possibilities here. Either China will concede to the policy changes that the United States wants, or else China doubles down. And of course, there are many shades of gray in between. Presumably, the United States has war gained the diplomatic, economic, and military scenarios that can proceed from escalation, crisis management, and ultimately, conflict, and is prepared for each of these contingencies. Second, if we are now in a period of strategic competition, what are the new rules of the game? How is a common understanding to be reached with Beijing as to what these new rules might be? Or are there now to be no rules other than those which will now be fashioned over time by the dynamics of the new competitive process? The reality is that after 40 years of bilateral strategic engagement, the culture, the habits, the norms, and in some cases the rules that have evolved to govern the parameters of the bilateral relationship have become second nature to several generations of political, diplomatic, military, and business practitioners. If we are indeed now in a brave new world, what rules will govern the avoidance of incidents at sea, such as what's happened recently with the USS Decatur, incidents in the air, cyber attacks, nuclear proliferation, strategic competition in third countries, the purchase and sale of US Treasury notes, the future of the exchange rate, and other major policy domains? Or has the United States concluded that China is already in such fundamental violation of pre-existing bilateral norms that there is nothing to be lost by moving into a new strategic terra nova, where there are no longer any norms governing the relationship? This is an important question to settle in the administration's mind. Third, and closely related to the first two factors, is whether or not any common strategic narrative is now possible to set the conceptual parameters for the future of this most critical of bilateral relationships. Strategic engagement as a concept implied a set of mutual obligations which the United States now argues China has fundamentally breached. But in the absence of new rules to govern the parameters and content of the relationship, how can we readily arrest any rapid slide through strategic competition, having it seems already skipped through a short-lived period of strategic coexistence? To containment, to cold war, to confrontation, to conflict, and even war. If history is any guide, these changes can unfold more rapidly than many postmodern politicians might expect. The escalation from a single incident during the summer of 1914 is a sobering point. While readily conceding that the age of nuclear weapons has deeply changed this traditional strategic calculus. Fourth, if US strategic planners are indeed considering the possible evolution of strategic competition with China into full-blooded containment, as some, it seems, have argued on the periphery of the administration, comprehensive economic decoupling also is a desirable objective and even a second Cold War 
But this would require a long, deep analysis of the underlying logic of um, George Kennan's famous long telegram of 1946 and his sub subsequent article, authored X, on the sources of Soviet conduct, published the following year. Kennan, who in my judgment was brilliant, uh, argued that if properly contained, quote unquote, the Soviet Union would be ultimately likely to break up because of its internal pressures. It would, however, be an heroic assumption to assume that the Chinese system would ultimately collapse under the weight of its internal contradictions should a policy of a similar nature be applied to it. It might, but it may not, given the resilience of the Chinese domestic economy, its capacity to secure its energy needs from other US ad adversaries around the world, and now the new potentialities offered by the various new technologies of political and social control now available to Beijing for its domestic population. On this point, it's worth noting that as of 28 September 2018, the PRC passed the Soviet Union as the longest surviving communist state in history. Its many vulnerabilities may be apparent, and having worked on China for the last 35 years, I know a few of them. But the prospect of collapse appears remote, and it's certainly not, in my judgment, a bankable proposition. Fifth, is the United States convinced that the emerging Chinese model of authoritarian capitalism of itself represents a potent ide ideational challenge to democratic capitalism, whether it be of the conservative, liberal, or in my case, social democratic variant? The Soviet Union constructed client regimes around the world of a similar ideological nature to its own. Is there evidence that China is doing the same in third countries? These are questions which should be probed. Sixth, will the United States be prepared to make a strategic counteroffer to the world to the financial commitment reflected in China's combined multi-trillion dollar programs reflected in the Belt and Road Initiative, concessional loans, and bilateral aid flows? Or will the US continue to slash its own aid budgets and reduce the size of its foreign service? U.S. support last week for a new capital injection into the World Bank is a welcome development. But this amount pales into insignificance with the dimensions of the Belt and Road Initiative. Seventh, beyond concessional finance and grant aid, there is the broader question of how the U.S. will compete over time with the sheer magnitude of China's trade and investment volumes in Asia and Europe. I've referred already to the cancellation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the non-advance of the free trade agreement with Europe. Therefore, when countries across the region already have a larger economic relationship with China than they do with the United States, where does this go to in time? As, through sheer economic weight, more countries are drawn within the political and foreign policy orbit of China. Eight, for these and other reasons, how confident is the United States that its friends and allies around the world will fully embrace its new strategy of strategic competition with China? Of course, relations between the US and some of its principal European allies have been under some stress in recent times. Will these countries, both in Europe and in Asia, continue to hedge in their own relations with Washington and Beijing, waiting until it becomes clearer whether the announced strategic shift in US policy is permanent and whether it has a good prospect of success. And we see this, of course, in other regions of the world as well. Nine, there's the related question of what constitutes the new American ideational appeal to the rest of the world to support this new US strategy as an alternative to a China-dominated region and world. Having reread Kennan's long telegram the other night in preparation for these remarks, one of the fascinating elements of Kennan's observations back in 1946 was the paramount importance of engaging the court of public opinion at home and abroad to explain the rationale for what he outlined as being a strategy of containment applicable to the Soviet Union at the time. When I read carefully Vice President Pence's, Pence's speech last week, it was consciously and eloquently couched in the terms of American national interests and values but it made no appeal to the international community's common interests and common values, which historically we have shared with America and which have been historically articulated through the American-led global rules-based order, crafted after the last world war. Therefore, it's important that the United States craft a global message and not just a national message in this age of America first. <laughs>
And finally, there is the more immediate question of the impact of a major cleavage in US-China relations on the global economy and climate change action. If US-China trade collapses or even reduces significantly as a result of any radical approach to the decoupling of the two economies, given the importance of global supply chains, what will be the impact on global economic growth in 2019 and beyond? And what are the prospects of it triggering a global recession? Similarly, in the light of the just released October 2018 report on global climate change by the IPCC, pointing to potential planetary disaster because of inadequate action by the world's major emitters, what will happen if China reverts to its own more limited national measures at carbon mitigation, particularly if the current global climate change regime becomes a major casualty of any implosion in the US-China relationship? These are 10, in my argument, significant questions which US and your friends and allies uh, will be thinking about through their policy deliberation uh, institutions in the weeks and months ahead in response to the changes in the administration's approach to China and this new era of strategic competition. And my argument simply is this. In embracing such a new approach, the United States should do so with its eyes wide open. Because the truth is, we are now navigating relatively uncharted waters in this relationship. Literally, if we look at what happened with the USS Decatur a week or so ago. Also because none of us in this room want to see the triggering of unintended consequences, least of all unanticipated crises and conflicts by accident. Let me conclude. Most of us gathered at this conference who take the US-China relationship seriously struggle with the sheer intellectual and policy complexity of the subject. It's not easy, it's hard, and I've been at this for 35 years as a student, as a foreign service officer, foreign minister, prime minister, been to China more than 100 times, lived there for several years. It's hard, none of it's easy. But the purpose of concerted intellectual effort is to produce the greatest clarity for policy. I fully recognize that in the charged political atmosphere in which we now find ourselves, both in the United States and in China, it's a difficult environment to work in. The protagonists of one view are variously described, sometimes under the breath, as either China appeasers or less politely panda huggers. Protagonists of a different view are usually described as either coal warriors or warmongers. I don't think any of that really helps. We all need to be wary of the re-emergence of any new McCarthyism or the reconstitution of a new committee on the present danger where any of us seeking to explain the complexity of China's rise are pronounced guilty of un-American activities, or in my case, un-Australian activities. Mind you, that leaves you a much wider scope. If we offer a complex response to what is otherwise rendered as a simple question, namely what to do about China's rise. As I said before, this is a hard question. The bottom line is, I fear both in the United States and Australia, and certainly in China, uh, the space for an open, considered public debate and discussion on the China question is becoming increasingly fraught. Of course, it's easy politics simply to join the cheer squad and to deliver one rah-rah speech or another. It's much harder to think our way through as to what might constitute sound, enduring public policy capable of realizing agreed objectives to preserve freedom, to preserve prosperity and sustainability in the long term while not producing unintended consequences on the way through, least of all crisis, conflict, or war. At this time, in the context of the great national China debate, which is now unfolding in this country, I'm always reminded of the sage advice of Henry Kissinger, a friend and colleague, who I see often in New York, where I now live. When we established my policy institute, the Asia Society Policy Institute, and Dr. Kay became the inaugural chair of its International Advisory Board, we asked him what our mission should be. In a classically Kissingerian haiku, Henry responded in his gravelly voice that we should seek to identify three things about the world today. First, what's really happening out there? Second, why is it happening? And third, most troubling of all, what are we not seeing? If asked at this stage of the debate what side I'm on, I am a lifelong supporter of the alliance with the United States, even when it's been politically unpopular in my country, during the days of the Iraq war, for example. I'm also on the side of the avoidable war. I'm also on the side of preventing an unnecessary war. 
And I'm on the side of, isn't there a third way beyond the demands of either capitulation or confrontation to help navigate our way through the Thucydidean dilemma, which we now confront, and which my good friend and colleague Graham Allison will speak to you about soon. And in pursuit of that objective, I believe we in the policy community in the academy have a particular responsibility at this critical stage of the process to shed as much light as possible on what we are seeing, rather than simply adding additional heat. There is already way too much heat. And shining light also requires us to understand reality as perceived through the eyes of others, even if we then choose to reject it. Solid strategy and good policy are hard. And I look forward to the contributions of others at this conference, those of good heart, strong mind, and deep experience of China and the United States seeking to find a way through this most classical of modern security dilemmas. And for those of you here who are women and men in uniform belonging to the United States Armed Forces, personally, as someone who's seen you in the field so often in so many theatres when I've been in office, I thank you for your service. Mr. Rudd, thank you for those tremendous remarks. Uh, we ran a little bit over, and so we're going to have to take a break in a minute. But I want to thank Mr. Rudd for providing his perspective. Often as Americans, we show it in our PowerPoint slides. We show it in everything we do. We put America in the middle. And it's good today to get a different perspective from Australia in the middle and from his context of having been here on the speaking circuit and living with us here in North America so much lately. And we truly appreciate your time. It's your most precious commodity, and you shared it with us today. And I want to give you this book, Great Powers, Grand Strategies, The New Game in the South China Sea by Anders Kaur. Thank you, Mr. Rudd. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a uh, short break and start the next session at 10:00. Everybody, thank you. That movie.